So let's begin by reading Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. That's our, our focus passage this morning. And they devoted themselves to the apostle, oh wait, 41 through 47. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple, together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praise God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, the Holy Spirit's been poured out, right? We saw that a couple weeks ago. They heard the sermon that the Holy Spirit had through the Apostle Peter. The first fruits were, were seen with 3,000 being convicted and, and trusting Jesus for their salvation. They were baptized, and it's pretty much an amazing beginning of the first church, right? 3,000 people. And yet imagine the tension that there must have been in Jerusalem. Just 50 days before, they had crucified Jesus at the insistence of the rulers of the Jews and the, and the agreement of the crowd. Many of those who were gathered there that were hearing this sermon from Peter. Just... Now, there's this group of 3,000 who have accepted Jesus as their Messiah and Savior consisting mostly of those who had journeyed from outside of Jerusalem or even outside of Israel. And they were there for Pentecost, and they're a long way from home, and their world has just been turned completely upside down. These new believers were devoted to Jews, or were devoted Jews, who had come to accept the fact that the Messiah had come, he had died for their sins, he rose from the grave, and it had ascended to heaven. But while scholars vary on their estimates, they suggest that there were about 200,000 people in Jerusalem at Pentecost, at that Pentecost feast. And so there were about 197,000 who didn't believe what these 3,000 believed. This vast majority, and for this vast majority, nothing had changed. In their minds, another pretender had been executed, and everything, the Roman and the Jewish system, were still intact. Everything's normal. What very few realized was that this small group of believers, though, called the church, represent the beginning of the end of the temple worship period, temple worship system. And for the 3,000 converts, everything had changed. The law was fulfilled in Christ. Remember in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And suddenly, they're no longer trying to please God by obedience to the letter of the law. But instead, they've, they've had the spirit of the law written on their hearts, just, just as God said would happen through the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 31, 33, for, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and they will be, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So now they wanted to learn, these three thousand wanted to learn everything they could about the Messiah's life and teaching. And the first thing that we see is that they were devoted to to teaching. Verse 42, our, 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 our theme verse that I, I'm, I'm asking us to consider to adopt for the next year. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Remember that before Pentecost, the disciples had devoted themselves to prayer, waiting for the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Acts chapter 1, right? It said, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary and mother of Jesus and his brothers. 
Now, the new believers were continually devoting themselves to learning the apostles' teaching. Their teaching is summed up in the Gospels and expanded on in the entire New Testament, which had yet to be written. We're seeing here that where the Spirit is at work, a hunger grows for God's Word. The basics of the apostles' doctrine were what? Believe in God, repentance, accept the Lord Jesus, baptism, yield to the Holy Spirit, and grow in Christ's likeness. The apostles taught this group in the temple. It was the only place that was big enough to hold the 3,000 people. And the Jewish leaders must have been dismayed. Maybe even a bit perturbed about it. But see, after the Feast of Pentecost, most pilgrims returned home. This gathering of 3,000, they stayed coming every day to the temple to hear from Jesus' apostles. I can imagine the eagerness with, with which these new believers clung to every word, every account that these apostles were telling of Jesus through that three-year ministry that, he, that they were, he was with them. Bible scholars point to the, the same stories repeated in the Gospels and suggest that the, the authors copied one another. And that may be. I'm sure some of that occurred. But, but that is because they had not only experienced the same things, but they had heard one each other, each other teach it in the temple to these 3,000. These same accounts over and over again, numerous times to all these new disciples. We should ask ourselves if we're as devoted to the Gospels. We should memorize, should be memorizing and, and meditating on the Gospels. If I had to live with just one book in the New Testament, I probably would choose the Gospel of John. I don't know what book you may have chosen. It's a little different for everybody. And of course, we need the application and the doctrine too, though, that, that Paul provides in his letters. But the basis of it all is Jesus' three-year ministry that, that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The 3,000 already had a, a knowledge of the Old Testament. They were Jews. Now they needed to see how it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And the apostles had to teach the 3,000 what Jesus had taught them after the resurrection. Remember, he, in that 40 days after the resurrection, before he ascended, he did a lot of teaching and how the Scriptures were fulfilled in Jesus' life. It says in Acts chapter 1, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. They needed to learn the parables and the sayings of Jesus. But most of all, they needed to understand how his death and, and atonement for their sins so that they could be vessels that the Holy Spirit can occupy. So that their lives can glorify God. Isn't that what we need to, to know and continually be reminded of? All of us. While we, we have a head knowledge of, of what Jesus did for us, we often fall short of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. He wrote, Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. One of my all-time favorite theologians, and one who has definitely helped shape my understanding, has, has been quoted as saying, you begin to learn to interpret your life in terms of what God says about you because you are united to Christ instead of interpreting the gospel in terms of where you are in your struggle. Those are pretty profound words from Sinclair Ferguson. Paul was also absorbed with this reality. And he would say in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Regarding the, the apostles' teaching, it, it also included the second coming. They taught that Jesus was coming again and that we should live in, in expectation of his return. They also taught the great command 
to love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and strength and, and, our, and love our neighbors as ourselves. And they taught the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey what Jesus commanded. And all things we strive to understand and do today. But it wasn't just the teaching the 3,000 who were devoted. These 3,000 were devoted to not just the teaching, they were devoted to fellowship too. Our Bible study groups that we keep coming back to, they teach the basics of this verse. But if we are to go forward in our spiritual life, we need to not only be in the Word, but we need to be in fellowship. Neglect fellowship and our spiritual growth will suffer. Neglect the basic causes, neglect of the basics, causes us to be ineffective. Fellowship is the the Greek word is koinonia. It's sometimes translated as, as giving or, or an offering. It means to be more than just being together. It means um, it's, not just, it's not just shooting the breeze and having coffee and just being in close proximity. The, no, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with small talk, but it's, it's a sharing. It's a spirit, we're spiritually strengthened when we share what God is teaching us. Scripture that has inspired us and, and lessons that we're learning and even the trials and the burdens in life that we're sharing or that we're experiencing, we need to be sharing. It's giving of ourselves to one another. We don't have potlucks on the second Sunday of every month just because we're hungry. We do it for an opportunity to share with one another. Let me think of it like this. Imagine God's kingdom as a mosaic. You know what a mosaic is? It's a picture made up of little tiny tiles, right? Little maybe one inch by one inch tiles. Picture God's kingdom as a mosaic. And let's say it's all covered up. And all the believers have been given three pieces of tile to carry around in your pocket. And as you fellowship with other believers, you get to share your three pieces of tile. And they'll share their three pieces of tile with you. And you know what happens? That mosaic starts to uncover starts to get bigger. And all through our lives as believers, as we journey together and we're sharing each other's tiles, God's kingdom starts to unfold. And they'll never be fully painted until that final day when we're called home. But how cool is it that we get to see it starting today? We share it with each other. I love it when people take a long time to leave the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. I love it when people come early on Sunday mornings and, and share. Because they're sharing, they're connecting, they're, they're building and strengthening relationships together. Just through conversation sometimes. Verse 42 also says that they were devoted to the breaking of bread. This most obviously refers to the common meals shared between the, the earliest disciples. We see that in verse 46. Some scholars have argued that it's a that this expression in verse 42 is referring to the Lord's Supper, and that it was a, a, a separate from the ordinary meals. But the term also describes how Jews referred to an ordinary meal when they would, would break a loaf, break a loaf of bread with their hands, and give thanks to God. So to break bread was to eat together. The adoption of this term as an alternate title for the Lord's Supper, that didn't actually happen until sometime after the 2nd century, or in the 2nd century. Note also that after Luke mentions in verse 46 that, that they were breaking bread in their homes, he goes right on to say literally they received their food. The reality of Christian fellowship is expressed from the earliest times in the ordinary act of eating together. These 3,000 ate together with glad and sincere hearts, verse 46 says. And in praising God, says in verse 47. Maybe as they gave thanks for their food, they focused on the work of Jesus, reminding each other of their fellowship in Him. And, and in this way, a, a meal could be given the same sort of significance, I guess, that, that Paul wrote about to the Corinthians regarding how they should be approaching meals. But let's not get wrapped around the axle and, and miss the point that they were devoted to teaching, fellowship, eating together, all wonderful things. 
but they were also devoted to prayer. Of these main ingredients of, of spiritual life, prayer may be the most difficult for us to practice. The disciples asked for Jesus to teach them to pray. In Luke chapter 11, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. They saw Jesus' as prayer life, and they, they knew they needed to, to learn how to do it and to be more like him. You can ask the Lord to teach you to pray, but then you need to set aside time to let him teach you. If you don't know how to pray, begin with the Lord's Prayer. Repeat the Lord's Prayer. Or simply pray Scripture back to God. This is God's Word. How honoring is it for Him or to Him to preach His Word back to Him? However you pray, take time to be still, though, and listen so that the Lord can speak to your heart, as the psalmist reminds us. It says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. They were devoted to teaching and fellowship, and meals together, prayer. Putting it all together, they were devoted to Christian living. In verses 44 and 45 of the passage, we read, And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Remember that, that most of those making up the 3,000 were out of towners. They're a long way from home. They did not intend to stay beyond Pentecost, so they weren't prepared to stay any longer. And the solution was sacrificial giving. Everyone shared all that they had so that all the needs could be met. If some had more resources, they shared with those who had a need. Some who were from surrounding areas sold some property, maybe. Others had possessions that they could sell. And there was such a unity in the Holy Spirit that one considered their possessions to, to not be their own. They sold them and shared everything that they had. They fully accepted the truth of Jesus' words. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, he says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. They saw that the Lord God had provided them so that they could meet the needs of others. We see Paul referring to this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 when he says, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. Now, there's been a lot of nonsense written about these two verses. There have been those who have said that the early Christians gave up their capitalism and became socialist, sold everything they had and put it all into one pot, divided it up amongst themselves. But that's not what this passage is saying, folks. All this is saying is that they established a common fund, which the, for the needy, and it was for the needy among them, they shared their possessions, but, but more importantly, they shared a desire for the things of God. When they came together for worship, there was a common desire to serve the Lord in a way that pleased Him. They were willing to sacrifice for the good of the church and for others. If we're to become what we need to be, we must all share a common focus. We must all agree on why we are here. We've not come to please ourselves this morning, but to serve the Lord. We cannot have a me or a mine mentality on Sunday mornings. It isn't about us. It's all about Him. Jesus is the reason why we've come here today, right? We must make Him the focus and desire of our hearts. I think there's a lot of churches out there who don't prosper because they can never agree on what it is they're to accomplish. Do you ever consider why we're here? You ever consider what would happen if we weren't here, if this church wasn't here? 
What are we meant for today? What's the purpose of us being here? Year after year, we see that God, He, he enables us to invest in missions. In spite of our small numbers, we're not a big church, but we meet our goals every year for all of the mission givings that we do. That is the result of God speaking to your hearts. We respond to God's leading, not to my pleading. So that God gets all the glory as He should. And then it says in verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. We've looked at this verse in parts already. But as a whole, this verse summarizes everything that was happening in the church. It appears that this was the new believer's full-time occupation. That's what these 3,000 people were doing day after day. The generosity of those who were wealthier funded the extended time of learning with provision and shelter. No one took any of this for granted. It says, received their food with glad and generous hearts. They realized there were sacrifices being made so that they could receive the apostles' teaching. And they were grateful for it and joyful. Well, all this foundational teaching and, and fellowship and prayer was going on, this church was also devoted to sharing the gospel. And look what it says in verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Did you catch it? Did you see what it said? There's a lesson for us here. Though they had a completely different perspective than their fellow Jews about the Word and life's priorities, they had favor with all the people, it says. Why is that? They were filled with the Spirit. And we know this fruit of the Spirit is what? Joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians chapter 5. And while faith in Jesus does cause division, there's no doubt believing in Jesus has caused division. And the world will certainly be upset with our views. Who doesn't respond favorably to love, and joy, peace, and all the other fruits of the Spirit? If you are overflowing with the fruits of the Spirit, unbelievers are more likely to be receptive to you. You can condemn them and, and tell them the, the truth out of duty, but, but sharing what Jesus has done for you through the love in your heart is much more likely to attract them to Jesus. If we're experiencing this favor with the, the people who, who don't believe, we might ask ourselves, is it my message or is it my presentation? Of course, people are, are bent toward rejecting the message of Jesus because they want to be Lord over their own lives. I acknowledge that. But, but we should not give them additional reason to reject the message because we're not good examples of it. Paul told the Corinthians, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Our passage closes this morning with encouragement. Everything they were being and doing, everything that they were focused on, led Luke to write, and the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Praise God. But what made all that work? In landing the plane, I have to ask, what makes this all hang together? How did this all happen? What's the driving force that made those believers feel free from their possessions, eager to meet the needs of others, and be full of gladness and generosity and praise and prayer when they ate together day after day without driving each other crazy? I think the key is found in verse 43. In the phrase, fear came upon every soul. A joyful, trembling sense of awe that you don't mess with the God of the apostles. That's not our experience. Today, for most people, 
including most professing Christians. God is a talking point, a topic in a debate, maybe a family tradition to be preserved. But for very few people is God an awe-inspiring, stunning, magnificent, present reality. Instead, we present him as an object, distant, silent, maybe even tame, a theory we choose to put our stock in. Where are the churches today in America that would prompt Luke to say, fear, awe, wonder, trembling is upon every soul? The absence of this fear has a direct effect on the way we, not necessarily we, but we, the American Christian Church, accumulate possessions for ourselves as we ignore the needy, devalue fellowship, play more than we pray. So I turn my ear off it. This is the simple truth about church growth. If we will devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, the Gospels, and fellowship, and the breaking of bread, having meals together, sharing life together, and to pray, and if we are filled with the Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit is evident in our lives to the people that we interact with, then we, in fact, are growing spiritually and the Lord will add to His church. That's God's church growth program. He will bring new believers because we will have become a place where they can grow in Christ. So how about a church? Will you join me in devoting yourselves to, to the Gospels, to fellowship, getting to know one another over a meal, to pray? Will you devote to an intimacy with God so that the fruits of the Spirit flow from your lives? Will you let the Holy Spirit lead you? And I'm not saying that we're not doing any of this today. We are. I think we're doing a lot of these things. We really do. Will you let the Holy Spirit lead you? Join me in making Acts 2.42 our, our theme for this coming year. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I firmly believe that we, we, this time this church, will be blessed beyond measure if we yield our spirits fully to the Holy Spirit and wholeheartedly commit to the word, fellowship, and prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, you, you are our Prince of Peace. And you prayed for the unity in the body of Christ, that we may be united in love, just as you are united with the Father in love. We ask the Spirit, give us the desire to love one another as you loved us. And let the world know that we are you, your disciples by our love for one another. Give us a hunger to live in union with each other. And may we be united as one in the bond of peace and fellowship in the Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.